All right, so now officially welcome to the Red Lines of Bordeaux webinar. Uh, my name is Alessandra Steves. It's a pleasure to be here tasting red Bordeaux and talking about Bordeaux. For those of you who know me, I am a big fan of Bordeaux wines and I am in fact a Bordeaux wine tutor. So, um, and that is, you know, because we are approaching um, winter or fall, um, that is why I chose to have some Bordeaux in here. So I know Marcos is in Connecticut, you know, but here in Florida, today was a chilly day and we had a, around what, 84 Fahrenheit, 85 Fahrenheit. So, so yes, people were wearing jackets, but I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, in, in Hartford it's much colder than that as of right now. So red wines is just, you know, what we need to, uh, to the end of the year. So uh, let me start by introducing myself for those of you who do not, do not know me. So my name is Alessandra Steves. I am the director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy. Um, I have the Diploma in Wine and Spirits, which is the level four of the WSCT. And um, more recently, I am in the Masters of Wine program. I am a Master of Wine candidate, and I am on stage two. There are three stages, you know, very hard examinations. I, you know, if I complete or when I complete the Master of Wine, it should take me five years or so. So, but I'm really looking forward to be on that program as well. Um, I have many other different certifications uh, about wine, but I am uh, an official uh, Bordeaux tutor by the Ecole du Vin de Bordeaux. And that is why I can, you know, teach and send you guys certificates as well, okay? So a little bit about Florida Wine Academy for those of you who, um, who have never been at the academy. So we teach a lot of different courses and certifications. WSET, we teach, you know, level one, level two, level three in wines. We teach level one in spirits as well, level two in spirits, sake. Um, and then we have French wine scholar, Spanish wine scholar, and we will begin with some um, Italian wine scholar prep which is, you know, a course be, be, um, before the Italian Wine Scholar. So that is coming up in January. And also, you know, a very cool thing, and you guys are the first to know, um, we have partnered with uh, the Whiskey Academy of the End End um, Edinburgh. So we will have, you know, online whiskey courses really soon. So stay tuned, okay? All right, so um, without any further ado, let's begin talking about Bordeaux. So here on this beautiful picture, this is La Place de Bordeaux. So, you know, the La Place de la Bourse. It is a famous place um, in Bordeaux. It's just overlooking the river. You know, there are cafes and people um, meeting here to play some sports or music. So um, it's a really beautiful place in Bordeaux. It is in the city center. So, and I think it is very representative of, you know, the city um, and, and the region itself, okay? So this is just, you know, to take our minds out of work or, you know, kids, if you have them, and just, you know, take a minute, breathe in, pretend you are in Bordeaux, and let me take you on a journey to Bordeaux, okay? All right, so um, I want to talk tonight about Bordeaux red wines specifically. As Marco says, it is Bordeaux weather. So, um, so yes, I'm going to focus on that. And I plan not to be too geeky, but I want to talk, you know, a little bit about fermentation and maturation. So we do really understand how Bordeaux red wines are made, okay, and what makes them special as well. So um, this is the roadmap for tonight. So I'm gonna uh, introduce you to the Bordeaux region. We are going to take a look on the vineyards. What they are, are, they, are, are they doing on the vineyards, the grapes? And then we are going to look at the cellar and fermentations, okay? And how to make a red wine. So we are going to see all of that tonight, okay? Now, Beginning with Bordeaux, uh, so Bordeaux is really the largest AOC vineyard in France, okay? So you can see we have almost 100 and, um, and 
11,000 hectares. And the second region in France is the Rhone Valley with 68,000 hectares. So Bordeaux is almost the double of the second largest region in France. So it is quite big and therefore we, you know, uh, we can have different qualities of wine as well, okay? And if, if you compare to Burgundy, Burgundy it is only 30,000 uh, hectares, Champagne as well, you know, Champagne uh, compared to Bordeaux is a tiny region. And as you explore the other regions, so Alsace is much smaller, Beaujolais is super small, and by the way, today is Beaujolais Nouveau Day. So it is the day that they release the Beaujolais Nouveau into the market. Um, you know, the wines have just arrived in the US. It is a big party and celebration. Not this year because of COVID, but um, yes, it is Beaujolais Day. So with that, you can see how important Bordeaux is um, for French wine, but also, you know, the power that they have um, by being so big, right? Take a quick look at this. So this is the sales of uh, Bordeaux wines. So 56% of Bordeaux wines stay in France, okay? Not only in the region, but think about that. Every fine restaurant in the country, being Paris, in Lyon, in Marseille, they will have Bordeaux wines on their menu, correct? Um, so 56% stay in France, 44% is exported, okay? So top three countries um, by volume, China is the number one. So they're drinking a lot of Bordeaux and they like red Bordeaux in particular because, you know, it is, is um, a symbol of wealthy and luck. Then uh, USA, we are the second one by volume and then Belgium, okay? So think about the volume that they drink in Belgium. They are doing a pretty good job in Belgium, right? Now by value, we begin with Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is really a center for fine wine in the world. So that is why, you know, it is the top three by value. Then we have China and the USA is number three. Okay, so we do like our Bordeaux, but we like, you know, very high, good quality Bordeaux. And, um, and yes, now you can see again, you know, that is the breakdown by volume in thousands of hectoliters, but you can see, you know, in the case of volume, China is a big piece of it, right? And then, you know, USA and Belgium are not too much, so a quarter of it. And um, in terms of value, it is just like one third for each country, um, with Hong Kong a little bit more than the um, than two other countries, okay? So, and that is millions of euros every year. So yeah, very important wine region, you know, largest wine region in France, very important export product, um, you know, in volume and value, um, exporting wines to very important countries, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about Bordeaux diversity, because when we talk about Bordeaux, of course we talk about red Bordeaux, but it's really important that you understand that Bordeaux produces um, something else, all right? So red wines, yes, for sure, we know that. We are going to taste the first wine in a second, uh, but then we have other styles. So first we have claret. Um, so, you know, what is that? Have you heard before this term? Um, any ideas, anything? Because we had in the past, you know, the British calling Bordeaux claret, um, but this is a different style. Any ideas? If you want to share, if you know what it is. Yeah. So in this case, this wine is um, a light red wine. It is between rosé and red. So it is not as light as a rosé, but it's not as strong as red. Um, I drank this wine um, in Bordeaux. It's very small production, but you know, it is just delicious. It's just a refreshing version of a red wine that will be perfect for, you know, the Florida weather, but uh, they basically do not export this wine. Okay. But Claret, 
is um, a light red wine. Then we have rosé, we have dry white wines from Bordeaux, sweet wines like Sauterne, and then finally we have Creme de Bordeaux, which is the sparkling wine made by traditional method, okay? So um, as you know, champagne can only come from Champagne, France, right? There is no other champagne in the world. I know we, we do have California champagne, but that doesn't count. So in other places in France, you have to call it Cremant, okay? So in this case, it is Cremant de Bordeaux, traditional method, sparkling wine. All right, so this is, you know, the Bordeaux diversity. We have all of that. Of course, we are focusing on red wine today only, but yes, there are six families of Bordeaux wines. The other thing about Bordeaux is, um, you know, the appellation. So Bordeaux has 65 AOCs. So within Bordeaux, we have all of that that you see on the screen in here, okay? So for instance, the first wine that we see in here, it is called uh, Montagne Saint-Emilion. So the La Croix Blanche, it is Montagne Saint-Emilion, which, you know, on the screen you see right here. So this is a satellite of the city of San Emilio. So it is not San Emilio AOC, not the Appalachian San Emilio, but it's around San Emilio, okay? So, so 65 Appalachians, that, that means, you know, labeling terms can be a little bit complicated as well. And, um, and then, you know, for the red wines, which is really important and really what we wanna um, talk about tonight. So there are styles of red wines in Bordeaux. So three different styles. Um, wine number one, red wines that are smooth and fruity. They are ready to drink. They are accessible when young. And you know, if you want to sell this wine, maybe you keep this wine for one to five years. So this is the, are the wines that you pay, you know, $16, $17, it is ready to drink right now, okay? So I suspect it is going to be wine number one, all right? So um, not, wine number two, it is a red wine, round and a little bit more structure, okay? So um, mostly in the right bank, but can be on the left bank of Bordeaux as well. And I'll show you guys on the map. Um, has more Merlot, and um, you know, very round tannins. So these wines you can keep for up to 20 years, okay? Um, and then finally, we have you know, the powerful, intense red wines from Bordeaux. So this is Cabernet Sauvignon dominant, wines of character. Think about the Grand Cru wines of Bordeaux. You can sell this wines from five to 15 years. Okay, so these are powerful. They will have, you know, a ton of new oak, um, and that will allow the wine to age. Okay, so tonight we are going to stay between wine number one and wine number two. Wine number three, we can leave for another time. Uh, but of course, you know, this powerful, intense red wines, they are really pricey as well. Okay. Uh, before I move on, uh, Claret is asking, what is AOC? So AOC, it's the Appellation Laws in France, okay? It uh, stands for Appellation d'Origine Controlée, so uh, the, the control appellation of origin. So that means um, Bordeaux is an AOC, Champagne is an AOC. So um, in the U.S., we have what is called AVA. So for instance, Napa Valley is an AVA, okay? So it is a region that is protected um, because of its name, its fame, um, and what it does. So it has rules and regulations to follow, okay? So other famous AOC in France is uh, the cheeses AOC. So Camembert, you cannot do, you know, Brie or Camembert outside of the region of, of production. So that is the AOC, all right? Okay, so um, with that, and I think you guys are thirsty, so please go ahead and pour uh, wine number one. 
which is the Chateau La Croix Blanche, Montagne Saint Emilion, 2016. Okay, so um, I have the wine here in my glass. Um, so go ahead and pour the wine if you are going to uh, drink this wine tonight. If not, I can guide you through it. So first of all, let's take a look at the name, right? Um, so Chateau La Croix Blanche. Blanche in uh, French means white, but it is not um, the, the wine that is white. It is the La Croix, which is white, okay? So the, the cross is white. So this is, uh, you know, the castle from the white cross. That is the translation, okay? Um, it is funny because, you know, when I ordered uh, this wine for 305 wines, um, uh, my partner saw the invoice and he said, okay, you order a white wine. And I said, no, I didn't. But you know, that is the name of the chateau. So this is a red wine, um, as you can see by the color in my glass, uh, in Montagne Saint Emilion. Okay, so now we are in the outskirts of Saint Emilion. We are not in the main region. Okay, so um, if you think about New York, you're not in Manhattan you're just, you know, in Brooklyn, for instance, okay? So you're around of Saint Emilion. 80% Merlot, 20% Cabernet Franc. Every time we have Merlot in a, brand, in a blend, it'll give you roundness. You know, the wine will be plushy and easy to drink, okay? And in this case, the wine has been aged for 12 months in French oak barrels, all right? So go ahead and taste the wine. Take a few minutes to taste the wine. Um, and let me know, you know, what you think. Hmm. So yeah, on the nose, it's pretty intense. Um, and you have, you know, this notes of uh, plum. So think about black plum, red plum. There is some minty character as well and some, you know, kind of toasty notes. Um, smells delicious. So it is my first time tasting this wine as well. So cheers, guys. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So to talk a little bit about um, 2016 in Bordeaux, it is a very good vintage. And um, the wines are going to be, you know, ripe, maybe a little bit more alcohol than, um, you know, in other vintages. And they are going to be a lot more fruit forward um, than what they are usually are, okay? Yeah, so Marcos is saying plum, cigar box, raspberry, and I totally agree. So plum is the marker for Merlot, is definitely in here. Cabernet Franc has more red fruit aroma, so the raspberry is a very good um, note, and I agree. Cabernet Franc can be very herbal as well. Um, so, so yes, I, I agree. Let me see, because somebody here is raising um, her hand. I don't know if it was. Ian, any questions, anything? All good? Let me know, you can write on the chat box. Um, yeah, so in this case, the wine has 14% alcohol. So again, you know, it is that ripe vintage in Bordeaux. Um, 2016, they say will age a lot of time because of this concentration, this intense fruity notes. Um, yeah, but I like the wine. So, so again, you know, we are not in the prime region for Merlot, but um, um, it is, you know, in the outskirts. And Ian says pepper, oak, musty soy. Yeah, exactly. So very good point, Ian, because, you know, the wines of Bordeaux do have this earthiness, right? If you compare to a Napa Merlot, the Napa Merlot is pure fruit. And then, you know, Bordeaux wines, they always have this something else that gives them a little bit of complexity. So I totally agree, you know, this soil, 
damp earth earthy type of aroma is definitely here and yes the pepper you know it's probably coming from the french oak barrels so yeah definitely pepper in this wine yeah yeah so what do you think about the wine good very good acceptable drinkable let me tell you the price okay so anchor is saying very good also spelling coffee chocolate yes exactly a lot of people describe uh, merlot with mocha so you know it is the mixture of coffee and chocolate so yeah you got it okay so ian is saying drinkable acceptable okay i kind of so before i say anything so the wine is $19, okay? So um, yes, think about that. For you to buy a Bordeaux, um, $19, and, and this came after the tariffs. So you know, you're paying 25% in tariffs in here. So really this wine should cost around 16. I think it is okay. I think it is a good quality, right? Yeah, so now Ian is saying then definitely excellent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, for $16 for a Bordeaux wine, I think it is, you know, it is okay. It is a wine that you can have, you know, nothing special. You, you don't need to do anything special. It is just a bottle. And I do believe, I'm a firm believer in decanting wines and opening them. So, you know, if you tasted this today and want to taste Later today or tomorrow, it'll be even better. But yeah, this is the wine that you can have, you know, with any um, type of food, cheeses, um, think about that, some roasted meats, some roasted chicken. It is not too powerful and strong. Um, but yeah, it has some character and some personality. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I chose this wine on purpose as number one, because of course we, um, you know, that is, Montagne de Saint Emilion. It is an appellation that is not as famous as Saint Emilion Grand Cru, but um, you know, for you guys to see what what is the quality of an entry level Bordeaux, and I think it is good. Okay. Um, yeah. So Marco says good price, quality, uh, good to pair with a beef stew. I totally agree. Yeah. Exactly. And also you can pour into the beef uh, stew and, you know, make it even better, right? All right. So uh, before we move on, let me show you on the map. Okay. So that is um, the vineyards in Bordeaux. So Bordeaux lies very close to the Atlantic Ocean. And then it has um, a big river in here or two rivers that form an estuary. And so that means that all the influence that they have from the sea will go inland, okay? So, so it, Bordeaux is a maritime climate because it has a lot of this influence coming from the sea. So rain, humidity, all of that, okay? We divide Bordeaux into left bank and right bank. Left Bank Bordeaux, it is all these appellations that you see in here. So famous appellations like Margot, Poyac, saint Estef, Medoc, okay? All of this is Left Bank. And then Right Bank Bordeaux is where we have saint Emilion Grand Cru, Pomerol, okay? All of this is Right Bank Bordeaux. So, um, the reason that it is divided is because, you know, soils are very, very different. So soils in the left bank, this region over here, are very great, uh, are gravel soils. So think about stony soils, you know, big stones, just like this. To the other side, in the right bank, it is clay soils. And clay tends to hold a lot of water. So it is considered to be a cold soil, okay? So because of that, Cabernet Sauvignon will be mostly planted in the left bank because you have the stones that will keep the vines warm. And uh, Merlot will be planted where you have clay um, and the colder soils, right? 
So that is the big difference. So every time you see people saying, oh, right bank Bordeaux, left bank Bordeaux, what does that mean? It means that, you know, either the wines are going to come from this side or this side, and then they will have different characteristics, okay? Um, I am not going to talk about, you know, entre de mer, which is this big uh, green area in here which, you know, produces a lot of uh, dry white wine. I'm not going to talk about the sweet wines today, like Sauterne, uh, Serum, Barsac, okay? Um, so I'm just focusing on these two uh, areas on the map. And as you can see, so we have San Emilio, San Emilio Grand Cru, and we just tasted the wine from uh, Montagne San Emilio, okay? So it's just around uh, San Emilio in here. All right, so just some visuals for you guys to see. Okay, so um, let me talk about, you know, the red grapes of Bordeaux and what we have. Um, and I can share this presentation with you later. So, you know, I can send you a PDF and share with you later so you don't have to, to write everything. But very important to know is this percentage of Merlot in here. So um, when we think about Bordeaux, first we think about red wine, right? But second, we think about Cabernet Sauvignon. So now Cabernet Sauvignon, it is not the majority of the plantings in Bordeaux and it is not close to, you know, half of uh, what's Merlot. So Merlot is 66%, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon comes next with 22.5% only, okay? And the reason for that is that, you know, Merlot is very easy to ripen, especially in this maritime climate. Um, and also, you know, gives the wines its roundness, plushness. Um, so um, that is why it's, it's used in Bordeaux. Cabernet Sauvignon, late ripening variety, really tannic. The wines have a lot of aging potential. Uh, nowadays, um, you know, with climate change and, and uh, climates in the vineyards are getting warmer. So we are seeing more plantings of Cabernet Sauvignon too. The third grape uh, that we have is Cabernet Franc, okay, 9.5%. Um, very elegant tannins, more moderate tannins, and very aromatic red fruits like we saw with uh, the raspberry, okay. And now growing in quantity is Petit Verdot and Malbec. So Malbec is making a comeback in the region. Nowadays, it represents, you know, altogether only 2% of the plantings, but we know this, um, this is growing in, um, in plantings, okay? And Carmenere uh, is still a difficult uh, grape to ripen in Bordeaux, but yeah, some people are trying with it, okay? So most of the wines that we drink, they are Merlot, okay? It is very rarely to have a wine that is, you know, 95% Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux. And of course, we are talking about blends. So Bordeaux rarely does 100% uh, of one grape only. It is always a blend, okay? Okay, so now some visuals for you to see. Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc. Okay, Merlot, very plummy, um, you know, plushy tannins, um, round texture. Cabernet Sauvignon is powerful, tannic, um, a lot of the uh, black fruits um, and eucalyptus notes. And then Cab Franc is more raspberry, you know, herbal, moderate tannins, all right? Okay, and you know, to, also to talk about uh, vineyards, because we are still in the vineyard in here, and then I'm going to go to the winery, which is, you know, things that are very important for red wines and for red grapes. First, it is called de-leafing, okay? So every summer when, you know, your grapes are still green, but you're ready for them to start changing color, what you do is that you go into the vineyard and take out the leaves that were creating shade for these grapes. So think about that, how labor intensive is that, right? You cannot put a machine to do that because otherwise the machine will cut everything. So you have to do, to do the leafing by hand. 
So basically you go in the vineyard and you know, the pictures, I, I wanted them to be a little large, but I couldn't, but you can see now you see the bunches in here. They're really green still. Uh, but in here they were covered with leaves and now you're de-leafing. So these bunches are exposed to the sun. Okay. The other thing that, you know, it is very common in Bordeaux is called green harvesting. And green harvesting is, um, you take a look at the bunches and, you know, some bunches are just perfect and you see, okay, this bunch, I, I wanted it to, you know, move forward and uh, give me the fruit. Some other bunches, maybe they're too small, but maybe they are not ripening, you know, the way you desired. And maybe it is just too much for a vine. So you cut them and you just, you know, throw them in the soil. Um, so these are very labor intensive process, but you know, it will guarantee the quality, okay? So Anchor is, is asking, uh, when do you start the de-leaf? So that is only in the summertime. So, you know, and maybe late summer. So let's think about July, for instance. July, yeah, I think July. And green harvest, again, it is in July as well. Um, and the main thing about green harvest and the way that I explain this to people is, you know, think about that. If I had 20 kids and I had to feed all of them, probably, you know, probably, I wouldn't have, you know, the money to give them, um, you know, all the nutritious food that they need. Now, if I had only have two kids, you know, now I can uh, concentrate my effort, my energy and my money into giving them, you know, very nutritious food. And the same is with the vine, right? If you have one vine with, you know, 30 bunches, uh, you know, this vine will struggle to send energy, nutrients um, uh, to these bunches. But now if you do the green harvest, cut some bunches that you don't think they are going to be, you know, okay in the future, now the vine, it is only concentrating its energy on the main bunches, okay? That is called green harvesting. All of that happened before harvest, uh, which is normally September, October in Bordeaux. And then, you know, I don't want to be too uh, geeky, but I found this um, to be, you know, very interesting um, type of graphic uh, representation. So um, I don't want to, you know, focus too much on that, but <clears throat> think about that. As you're waiting for your grapes to ripen, and again, we are talking about red grapes, okay? So um, as the time goes, um, your acid levels drop, right, dramatically. And then your sugar levels will go up, okay? Because yes, you need to have a berry with sugar, okay? But what is important for um, black grapes is the anthocyanins, right? Because this is the color, this is the tannins. So if you harvest too early, you have low sugar, you have high acid, you have no anthocyanin, so, you know, your berry is not good, right? If you, uh, you know, harvest very late, you're going to have a lot of color, a lot of tannins, and a lot of sugar. But what about acids? Now, you know, your wine will taste uh, flabby. Sorry, let me go back. So um, the winemaker has to choose, you know, between the perfect moment to have the amount of sugar, that he or she wants, the amount of acid that he or she wants, but also the anthocyanins, okay? So um, you may have heard this before, it is called the physiological ripening. So not only I'm looking at sugar in my grape, but now I'm looking at tannins and colors as well, okay? And this is very important for red wines. All right, so um, I harvest my red grapes. They are in my winery, so let me begin with fermentations, okay? So, so again, you know, don't worry. Um, I can send you this uh, PowerPoint presentation, but really fast, I wanted to explain to you how to make a red wine. So we harvest the grapes, right? I have those grapes in bins, and then I'm going to go crushing those grapes. 
I do crush them so I can have some juice, okay? Um, then, you know, I put this crushed grapes in a tank. Um, it can be cement, stainless steel, oak. And what I'm going to have is a mixture of juice, skins, and seeds all together. I will add some yeast or I will wait for the yeast to start fermentation. Um, and then, you know, during fermentation is when colors, tannins, and flavors are extracted from the skins, okay? So, um, of course, I have different options for fermentations in here. So, you know, how much time do I want to have these wines on the skin? The extraction method, which we will talk about later. Fermentation temperature, the type of fermentation, type of yeast their fermentation and so on. So as a winemaker, I do have many choices, okay? So why does wine taste so different? Because of that, those choices. Why does wine cost so different as well? Because of this, those choices, okay? So let me show you, okay, so after that, uh, you know, the wine goes into pressing. Pressing is when you will separate the grape skins from the juice, okay? Now you don't need the skins anymore, so press them. You're going to use the free run juice and then the pressed juice or the pressed wine now that you can, you know, both combine or keep separate um, if you like. The wine will go into clarification, stabilization to make sure that you have, you know, a stable wine. And then it goes into aging in stainless steel or oak barrels, depending on the style. Later, bottling and maturation in the bottom, okay? So that is how you make a red wine and a red wine in Bordeaux. Of course, you know, there are a few things that you can do in here. Um, <clears throat> very important in Bordeaux is the hygiene because they are, you know, very... Um, very um, uh, concerned about that. So hygiene in all stages, okay? So cleaning, um, disinfecting, <clears throat> rinsing. So they do it all, even with the bottles. Normally those bottles are flushed with CO2 to, you know, remove um, any oxygens, but also, you know, anything that could be inside of the bottle, okay? And this, I found it very interesting, the use of SO2 in Bordeaux, it is 30 to 60% less than 40 years ago, okay? So they are finding other methods of cleaning and keeping the hygiene in the winery without the use of um, SO2. So, you know, hot water, vapor, um, uh, water vapor, all of that um, can help as well, okay? Now, um, yes, carbonic ice or, um, is, you know, or dry ice is another thing that they have been using in the wineries uh, a lot, because think about that. Every time you use dry ice, not only you're keeping, you know, the temperature a little cooler, but you're creating a layer that, you know, oxygen does not go in. So you're protecting the wine against oxidation by using dry ice, okay? So um, immediate results, so it is very um, much used by a lot of winemakers, not only in Bordeaux, but around the world as well. Um, and I wanted to show you some of the innovations for pumping over um, that you can use a spray system, okay? So as you're fermenting your red wines, you know, all the grapes, all the skins, they go up because of the CO2 inside um, the fermentation vat, so they go up. But you want to mix those together, right? Because you want to extract color. So uh, the way you use is pumping over, and you can use those spray systems, which are pretty cool. And, and then, you know, you're spraying um, in the tank again and mixing um, the skins uh, back to the juice. Another very cool machine is the punch down automatic system. So, you know, punching down was usually done by people, so labor. You take paddles and then, you know, you're going to mix this wine uh, together with the skins. It is very labor intensive. 
Nowadays, you can have this punch down automatic systems, you know, that will do the job uh, for you as well, okay? And this is used to extract color flavors and tannins. Now, lastly, you know, about the barrel aging. And, um, you know, this is a very, really complicated graph um, image, but I, I wanted to point out a, a couple of things about why oak aging is so important for Bordeaux. So the first thing is the oxygen, okay? So oak does lack oxygen go in. With that, you have a polymerization of tannins. So meaning those tannins are going to be softer, rounder, smoother, okay? And also you absorb a lot of the woody components. So think about that. When we find aromas of vanilla, you know, toast, um, spices, all of that is coming because of the wood, okay? So it will help with the turbidity of the wine as well because, you know, the, the wine will settle. The duration in uh, the oak will give even more aromas and flavors, more microoxygenation, and uh, you know the longer in contact with oak will make this wine um, um, more age worthy. So you know it will give the ability for this wine to age, and then of course the temperature you know to keep this wine um, stable. So barrel aging in wood is uh, very important and pretty much used in all Bordeaux. Even that $19 bottle of Bordeaux that we just drank, you know, had um, some oak with it, okay? All right, I talked a lot, you know, this was very geeky um, and I still have more to come, but I wanna take a break and taste wine number two in here because otherwise um, you guys are going to be overwhelmed with a lot of theory. So, um, all right, let's go into wine number two, which is Chateau Blagnan. Uh, it is a Cru Bourgeois from Medoc, okay? So in this case, we are in the left bank. So now it is totally different um, soil, okay? So more stony soils. And because of that, we have more Cabernet Sauvignon in the blend. There's a 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, only 40% Merlot aged for 14 months in French oak barrels, all right? So um, go ahead and, and if you're tasting the wine, take wine number two. Oh wow, it's so different. Thanks, Claret. Uh, so, you know, the theory, so Claret is saying that she loves the theory, thank you. I. Uh, you know, the, the idea for all the webinars is that, you know, you have to learn something, right? You have to leave the webinar saying, oh, I actually learned something tonight. But uh, there is always a point that, you know, am I speaking too much or is this, you know, just the right amount of theory? So that is why the wines, the break is good. So we can, you know, breathe in, uh, take some wine and then move on. Okay. Okay, so guys, um, if you're tasting Chateau Blagnan, um, so you know the nose is completely different. Um, so wine number one was more open, more fruity, and, and this one is kind of very deep nose. So think about that, black fruits, blackberry, um, black cherry, cassis, you know, so black currant. Um, then you have kind of some minerality in here, almost like, you know, stony or crushed stone. So, and then, oh wow, it is perfumed as well. I have violets in my wine, so really interesting. And, and then, you know, toast and um, again, spices. Yep. Yeah, so Marcos is saying blackberry uh, gave me earth. So Violet, yes, agreed. So he has all of that. And Norma is saying um, your wealth of knowledge, very grateful for the sessions during this time with restrictions on travel. Yeah, thank you, Norma. It is a pleasure, you know. Um, I know you have been following us for a very long time and we'll keep doing this 
for, you know, forever. Um, and we, one of the things we learned from COVID is that we'll never stop doing webinars because, you know, to have this chance of connecting people from outside Miami, it's great as well. So yes, we'll, we'll keep the webinars. Um, so Chloe is saying, um, the AOCs have strict rules and regulations regarding production. Are there regulations in Bordeaux? Yes. So, you know, they're, they are pretty strict as well, Chloe. So, um, you're right that they are moving to more technology advanced. Um, but that is all done within the Appalachian system. So just to, and this is a very good question. So good job. So um, Bordeaux, different than other regions in France, right? When you travel to France, when you travel to Italy, these people are, you know, agriculturists, right? They are, they're working the vine and everything. And Bordeaux had always, has always had this kind of, you know, more um, business side of, of making wine. So they are, they are thinking ahead in many things, okay? Not only with the equipment, but they are thinking ahead, you know, into certifying all, they wanted to certify 100% um, you know, into sustainability. They are doing a lot of that. They are thinking ahead uh, by allowing other grapes because they see the impact of the climate. So Bordeaux, because it is a large region, it has the money and the power to move things. And they are definitely ahead of it. But yeah, they are super regulated. Everything you want to do in Bordeaux, you know, you have to follow the rules. Um, so yes, it's, it's very... Um, Thing. So uh, last ASO to usage um, because of the British influence, N not always. So um, it is because it is now a philosophy for any winemaker in the world, right? You want to make things right. You want to make things better. So if you can use last ASO too, it is better, right? The other thing is that, um, you know, really talking about uh, the changes in temperature in the vineyard, being warmer now it doesn't rain too much so you don't need as much as so2 you needed in the past so it is a combination of things so first uh it is knowing what's good for the environment what is good for you know your neighbors what is good for the vines so it is the, that whole mindset that is changing okay all right thanks elena um yeah very good all right so um Okay, let me taste because I only smelt. Yeah, so Anne Curry is saying tobacco, white pepper, red currants, and I totally agree. So it is a more complex wine than wine number one, it has more depth, right? Not only now we have uh, the black fruits because of Cabernet Sauvignon, but the red fruits for Merlot are still there, right? So the red currants, maybe the plum, it is still there, but it has also a longer aging, okay? So, and definitely you can, you can feel the oak. So I can feel, you know, that toast, the smoke um, on my palate as well, right? And the tobacco, I totally agree. So, so yes, now, and let me check the, the price for this wine so we can, you know, compare. Um, but yeah, now the wine has a little bit more depth. Um, one thing, you know, you see a labeling term called cru bourgeois. So, uh, you know, this is a topic for a whole other class. Um, I don't want to go into that right now, but just saying, you know, Bordeaux has the Grand Cru wines, right? Cru Bourgeois normally are small chateau, small producers that were left out of the Grand Cru classification, so they created their own classification. It is a more artisanal wine, okay? So, but the wines are really well made. So in this case, for Chateau Blagnan, we have $25.99. So, you know, it is just a few dollars more than wine number one, 
but you know in my opinion the wine is better so you have you know more complex aromas and flavors longer finish i'm still i'm still feeling you know the black fruits and 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 the tobacco in here so you have this longer finish um for the wine which is a signal of a better quality okay so 14.5 percent alcohol okay and because Cru Bourgeois is part of, you know, this organization and they can declassify a chateau if they are doing a bad job or, you know, classify them, you have a sticker in here with hologram and, you know, all the bottles of Cru Bourgeois will have that, okay, that sticker. So, yeah, take a look at your bottle if you have it, okay. All right, any other questions, comments about this wine before we move on? Okay, all good then. Um, okay, so Anchor is, is asking if this wine should aid a bit, a bit more. I, I think it can, definitely. So. In this case, you know, the wine is 2016, has aged for four years now, but we are in those, those range that the wines can go from, you know, five to 20 years. This wine will not hold for 20 years, but I think, you know, eight to 10 years easily. So yes, uh, and that will soften the tannins as well, because even though the tannins are elegant and refined, you know, in here, I can, you know, feel in my cheeks, a lot of the tannins so either you have to age this wine a little bit more or you have to have a big piece of steak you know to cut through the tannins and if you're a vegetarian you can have maybe you know roasted cauliflower but yeah you need something you know smoky and and kind of powerful to go um with this wine but i i, I like it i think it is a good quality All right, so let me move on. Um, talking again about technical advances in the cellar, okay? So a lot of the research and development uh, done by Bordeaux. So um, of course, you know, the things they wanted to achieve is, you know, the aromas, the ripeness of the grapes, the taste. So all of that is taken into consideration, okay? So they will look at the wine. They will see if oxygen is needed in case in the barrel, right? Climate change. So, you know, varieties, clones, um, the diseases, you know, what can be done? So one very good example in Bordeaux, which I thought it was, you know, fascinating. So Bordeaux has a problem with gray rot, right? Gray rot is... You know, when you buy strawberries at home and you see that kind of gray thing in your strawberry, that is gray rot. It can occur in Bordeaux because of the climate. And um, so they started um, using bats against gray rot. And when I looked at that, I said, what? It makes no sense. You know, bats against gray rot, it doesn't make any sense. But then I understood that, you know, in case of this humidity, you have more moths. Um, and so, you know, the bats are there to eat the moths. And, um, and without the moths, now moths, I, I, I don't think I'm pronouncing it right. It's such a difficult word to pronounce for no native speakers. So M-O-T-H-S, moths. And, and so the bats eat them. And because of that, you have less um, problems with rot, okay? So the French call it the IPM, Integrated Pest Management. So instead of spraying a chemical thing, you know, to get rid of it, you have, you know, an animal that will eat the moth and then, you know, uh, make your problem better. So, so all of this is done through the research, right? And uh, it is done in Bordeaux because, you know, they do a lot of that. Um, also sustainable viticulture. So treatments, um, you know, pollution, genetics. Um, so we see a lot of that as well. Okay. And not only, you know, pollution and smoke, but also noise um, 
So, so they are trying to make the whole region better, all right? Now, <clears throat> some of the new techniques and materials, not only, you know, you, you, you have the new technique about being so much advanced, a lot of things that we are seeing in Bordeaux are the amphoras or the eggs, right? And some few producers that I visited um, last year when we could travel, normally I would go to Bordeaux every year since, what, 2015? I go to Bordeaux every year, but not in 2020, anyhow. So, but you know, they are using this amphoras and cement eggs because they wanted to see, you know, how can this benefit the wine? How was wine made in the past? You know, can we, we do that with a little bit of the wine and then blend it and make it better, okay? So one of the things that they did is this wine donut, okay? It is not for eating. It is just an inflatable donut shape um, um, kind of press. So you can do very gentle extraction, okay? So it is, you know, it is called wine donut because it has this shape, uh, but it's just an inflatable, very gentle type of uh, extraction, okay? Sorting tables, yes. Again, you know, for you to source the best berries that you wanna go into your wine. So again, it's very labor intensive, um, but now you're, you know, making this, um, in a more professional way. So all of this uh, will, you know, improve your microbiological management and will reduce the use of SO2, right? Because think about that, in, in my sorting table, I'm only getting the grapes that are, you know, ripe and healthy, right? So why do I need SO2 with healthy grapes? I don't, if I have a lot of rot, okay, now I need SO2 because, you know, otherwise um, the rot will take over, so to say. So, so yes, by being careful and, you know, with these new techniques and materials, I am able now to reduce the use of SO2, which is great for everybody, for the environment, for me as a winemaker, because I don't have to pay for it. So there is a lot of advantages, okay? Now, aging techniques, um, Barrels are most used in Bordeaux, but oak chips and staves can be used as well, okay, depending on the wine. Um, but I can use, you know, concrete vats, um, stainless steel vats, concrete eggs, and the terracotta amphoras, okay? So, so let's go over a few of those really fast. So first of all, concrete vats. Um, Temperature inside concrete doesn't change dramatically. So it is great for red wine making, okay? Stainless steel vats um, maintains a very neutral taste, very easy to clean. You can do temperature control. So normally it is going to be done for white wines or light reds. Now concrete eggs, it is very interesting because they say it has this natural movement during fermentation. So, you know, remember all of that, that we talk about cap management and, you know, pumping over, punching down inside the egg, you don't need it because, you know, the bubbles of CO2 kind of make this wine go around naturally. So um, that is the main benefit of the concrete eggs. And, you know, the terracotta amphora, it is again, a porous material. It lets oxygen goes in. So if you don't want to use any oak, but you need the, you know, a tiny bit of oxygen, there you go. You have the terracotta, you know, the, the um, amphoras that you can use. So, so they are experimenting a lot, um, which is fascinating. And, you know, normally when you do visit Bordeaux, you see a mix of all of this in the wineries. So yes, you see, you know, stainless steel tanks, uh, because they are easy to clean. It is nice and easy to ferment wines inside. Then you see cement tanks like this ones in here, okay? Oak vats, so the big oak vats for fermentation, okay? Then the oak barrels, the barriques, which are smaller. And then, you know, the eggs and the amphoras. So um, it's really interesting because um, 
what they say is that by choosing all those materials and blending the wine later, you have a more complex wine, okay? So think about that. If you're doing a tomato sauce, okay? And I'm going to use the example because half of my family is Italian, so I have to. Um, so if you're doing a tomato sauce and you just, you know, open the can, put the tomato sauce and serve it, it'll taste one thing. Now think about that. Put some olive oil, right? Put some onions, garlic, put the tomato sauce, oregano, fresh pepper, you know, salt. Now you're adding more things to your tomato sauce that at the end will be so much better than the other one, right? So the winemaker uses exactly the same thing, right? He uses stainless steel for freshness, you know, oak for the toasty aromas, the micro-oxygenation, cement vats because you will, you know, hold the temperature and make the extraction a lot easier. So by using all of that, at the end of the day, you have a much more complex product, okay? So it is a lot of work and then you have to blend it all together, right? It is a lot of work, but uh, in general, it is, um, you know, makes for a better wine, okay? All right, so um, any questions before we do our tasting? And I have to say that, you know, for the last wine, we have two different wines. So part of the group has Chateau Coutet, saint Emilion Grand Cru, and half the, the group has Chateau, sorry, Peyron, saint Emilion Grand Cru, okay? So um, go ahead and pour your wines if you have those. Um, um, and I'm gonna talk about the difference between them, okay? All right, so Olena is asking if it is um, possible to age in stainless steel and barrels after. Yes, absolutely. So there is no recipe for it. And as a winemaker, you can choose, you know, oh, I wanna age in stainless steel because I wanna have, you know, a very fresh style of wine. And then you put a little bit into barrels um, and they can be old or they can be new, they can be heavily toasted, they can be lightly toasted. So yes, there is no rule against that. You can, you know, make your choice um, depending on the style of your wine. All right, so um, we have two San Emilio Grand Cruz, okay? So half of the group will have one wine, the other half another wine. So um, it was, you know, because of distribution problems, we didn't get enough of Coutte. So, but they are exactly the same vintage. They are exactly the same quality. So I'm going to talk about, you know, Coutet first, um, and then I'm going to talk about Pero. okay? So if you have um, either or, I'm good. I have both. So, um, so Coutet San Emilio Grand Cru. Oh, let me go back. Um, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec and Cabernet Sauvignon. They don't give the breakdown, but you know, Merlot is the big part of the blend. So I'm imagining here 60, 70% of Merlot, probably, you know, 10 to 15 Cabernet Franc and Malbec and Cabernet Sauvignon are really small in, um, in quantities. So maybe 5% of each, okay? 40 years old vines and they age for 16 to 18 months in French oak barrels, okay? So now we are seeing longer aging um, because of course it is, a, you know, should be a better quality wine, all right? So go ahead and, and taste the Coutet San Emilio. Mm, this is beautiful. And meanwhile, let me check um, the price so we can compare and contrast as well. $36.99 for Coutet. And um, the second group will have Chateau Perrault, San Emilion Grand Cru, which is 90% Merlot, 10% Cabernet Franc. And the vines in here are 25 years old, okay? And again, they age for 18 months. 
and um, use French oak barrels. So they use, they use first year oak barrels, second year oak barrels, okay? So, yeah, so talk to me. What do you think about the wines? So, you know, comparing to wine number one and wine number two, first, this has a lot more body, right? So you have a lot more body, you know, a lot more volume in your mouth. Um, alcohol is, you know, 14%, so it doesn't make a difference, but you see it is a lot more wine. Um, and then it is very savory on the palate, yeah? So, so yes, Morgan says such a sexy wine and it truly is, you know, think about that. Every time you have Merlot is just, you know, round and plush. And, um, so, so yes, it is a, a very sexy wine. So Ian is saying about Chateau Perrault, it's great, complex, you know, has oak minerals, chalky. Exactly. So you see, you know, it is just a little bit more in, um, in structure, but it has so much more complexity, so much more, you know, structure. So really, really good wine. Um, so I have a question in here from um, Chloe, and she's asking when it says use French oak, does that mean completely neutral barrels or barrels used once or twice before? Very good question, Chloe. It depends on the producer. In this case, um, you know, they use one-year-old barrels. So one-year-old barrel will still have, you know, the vanilla, the toast, everything. After three years of use, probably you won't find any more flavors. Um, but in this case, yes, it is used, but it's one-year-old used barrels. Yeah. So Anchor is tasting Coute. And he says, you know, very perfumey on the nose, um, smokiness. Then on the palate, the blackberry plums, um, you know, oaky and chocolate. And I agree. So Chateau Couté is was the wine we were tasting for our level three in wine. So the WCT level two, three. So I had the pleasure of tasting this wine um, multiple times. And I think this perfumey nose, it is coming from the Malbec. So even though the Malbec, it is only a little bit, only 5% or 4% of the Malbec, you know, it is giving this, um, this fruity nose. So, so yes, really, you know, delicious wine. So Coute, $36.99. So yes, it is, it's a little bit more than, you know, wine one or two, but I think it has so much more complexity and um, it is so much interesting to taste and you know delicious so um, again 2016 is a very very good vintage in Bordeaux so you know you won't go wrong by choosing any of the wines um, like we, we said right $19 $25 now $36 it doesn't go wrong but it is just um, much more complex yeah so um, what would you pair with this wine? Because it has, you know, more structure, more volume, more body, more complexity. What would you do? Let me stop sharing my screen so you can um, see me again. View. Okay. Yeah. Olena said, you know, we can put view. I agree. So, okay. Lamb uh, for Marcos, lamb for Anchor. Okay. Great minds think alike. I like that. Morgan says wild mushroom risotto with grilled Austrian lamb chops. Okay. Can I come? Are you doing this tonight? Can I drive and can I come taste with you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Bordeaux is one of those places that they eat a lot of meat. Um, 
right? You have those wines. But at the same time, uh, they are, you know, very close to the sea. So you have oysters, you have scallops, you have, you know, a lot of uh, fishes that they also do uh, eat. But yes, I, I think, you know, lamb, lamb chops, veal is um, just perfect because yes, the wine is savory, right? It is not, you know, fruit forward only. It has this savory, earthy um, type of gamey notes, almost gamey notes. Yeah, very good. So, um, so Chloe is asking if they ever mix vintages in Bordeaux. No, they are not allowed to do that. So that is one of the things that, you know, um, Europe in general is very serious about, um, but in Bordeaux, they don't mix vintages. You know, if they could, uh, they could even out the bad vintages, um, but it's not done. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so, okay, let me see if um, I have some more questions. So, Anchor is asking, is there a benefit to buying Bordeaux wine futures? Very good question. So, uh, for those of you who have never heard about that, um, Bordeaux wines are sold in futures. Um, so, that means you buy the wine now and you get the wine two years from now. The advantage is, is just like buying a house, right? Or an apartment in construction. You will pay less. And when the wine is released later, maybe it will cost, you know, 20, 30% more. Um, there is a, um, a kind of wine exchange in London called Livex that they follow these trends. Um, so, so yes, definitely as an investment or even for drinking, um, it could be a very good thing. I remember having a client that he said, uh, you know, that in the 80s, he bought a lot of Bordeaux and then he sold it later. And, you know, the money that he made put all his kids through college. So he said it was, you know, the best investment of his life. He was just sad he couldn't drink any of it but it paid for the college. So definitely, you know, um, some of the vintages in the future will cost more. Um, Olena is asking, which vintages are great? So Bordeaux has a thing with number five. So normally, you know, vintages 1995, 2005, 2015, they're all good. 1945, um, it's um, excellent as well. So five vintages tend to be very good in Bordeaux, but uh, really specific vintages. So 1982, it was, you know, the first probably great vintage of Bordeaux, more recent ones. It was the vintage that Robert Parker start, um, started writing about Bordeaux, but probably all the wines that you see from 1982, they are fake wines, right? Because it was a, such a famous vintage. Everybody wants to have those so probably if you see, you know, Chateau Lafitte, 1982, yeah, I doubt it, it, it is a real bottle, you know, or you have to buy in auction. Um, so, so yes, but you know, more recent vintages, we had great, great vintages um, very recently. So 2009, 2010, uh, 2012 is a classic vintage, 2015, 16, 18 are all great. So basically, you know, in France, there is a thing that um, some areas see the climate change as le bon problème, the good problem. So it is a problem, right? And they are preparing for it, but at the same time, they are making better wine because now they have enough sun to ripen those grapes, right? which was a problem in the past with, you know, a lot, a lot of cloud covering and, um, and a lot of rain. So, so yes, most recently we had, you know, very, very good vintages. So the vintages that are now in the market, 2016, 2017, yeah, they're all great. Um, you can buy those wines and, and they will, you know, be very good wines as well. 
Yeah. Any favorites in the lineup? Number three? Right? Yeah. So that is the reason why we always leave, you know, the more complex wine for the end. So we can grow and see, you know, how wines can be um, better. Uh, if you have all three bottles open, I highly recommend that you go back to it, you know, retaste, compare and contrast, see the difference in quality because yes, number one was, you know, a fresh, um, delicious wine. But as we move on, we see more complexity, more intensity, you know, a longer finish, um, age worthy wines. And that is why the price uh, is higher as well. Yeah. So Ancour is saying Coutet, uh, Ian is saying number three wins, and I completely agree with you guys. Number three is just delicious. So, so I choose to pour wines number one and two with Coravin, uh, but you know, wine number three is the bottle that I'm drinking tonight. So yeah, yes. All right, guys, so any other questions, comments uh, before we finish, anything else? So what's the best way to store these wines? Um, yeah, so Anchor, did you open all the bottles of wine? Okay, yep, he did. So yes, uh, Mona says Vacuvan, I totally agree. So Vacuvan is, you know, basically cost $9, I think. We have it at the store um, at 305 Wines. So basically you put, you know, a tab in here, remove the air, and that will hold for, you know, another four, seven days or so. Uh, what I use for my wines, it's called Corvin, okay? And uh, in this method, you put this needle inside the bottle, and then you can, you know, remove the wine without removing the cork. So you can have a completely sealed bottle uh, by using Corvin. It is a system that costs $200, $300. So it costs a lot more. Uh, but you know, I have been using Coravin a lot because um, it is, it holds my wine. So I, you know, open one of the bottles and the other two, I can enjoy them later. So yes, Coravin uh, is great, but Vacuvin, it is, you know, the cheap and easy method, okay? If you don't have any of those at home, Put the cork back, put it in the fridge because you know with the cold temperature, the 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 oxidation will be slower. So so that will hold for some days as well. Okay. So so yes, Chloe says definitely recommend Corvin for anyone who drinks alone, and I agree. Um, so Marcos is saying he uses Corvin, but he had good success freezing half empty bottles. Oh, I like that. So, so yes, you fill the half bottles all the way to the top and then put them in the fridge. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. And Olena saying, um, yes, thanks so much. Classes are always great. Um, yes, Marcos, thank you all uh, for being here. Very good. Uh, thanks, Claret. Um, all right, guys. So this is it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. We have a still a few classes, um, you know, before the end of the year. So Mute Nicole will host a popcorn and sparkling wine. So she will have a champagne and a um, sparkling wine from California. And we will ship the popcorn uh, with it. It is an artisanal popcorn done here in Broward. Um, I think it is Boca Raton where they are located. So I'm looking forward to that as well because you know how fun it'll be to taste two different popcorns of two different sparkling wines. Um, and, um, and we'll plan some more classes and let you guys know soon, all right? So yes, all right. Of course, thank you so much guys. And yes, hope to be ba back in class soon as well. All right, thank you. Have a great, great night and cheers. <laughs>